Thank you. I, I got a late invitation for this talk and uh, I was tr told to try and come up with some interesting title. Obviously I failed, not too many people came, but uh, what I wanted to talk about was, uh, or what I will talk about, uh, as Dominic said, is really the application of knowledge and collaborative tools, uh, primarily in the pharmaceutical industry, but clearly has a lot of uh, importance with respect to the healthcare side. And I will be talking at some points about uh, the collection of patient data and so forth. If you could run a, uh, uh, an extraction algorithm against everything I'm going to say for the next hour, you would get the following themes. First of all, computer technology is pervasive, but actually only some of it, it makes a difference. Uh, and from the perspective of industry and, and uh, healthcare needs, really we need to support three key things. They are managing data and related kinds of information, supporting the way that people work together and promoting decision making. Okay, so you can now go to sleep because that's the, that's the high level thing that you'll get out. Although I don't think I'll probably say most of those words for the rest of my talk. And really, you know, what has made a difference to date? If those are the important things, computers are clearly available uh, and easy to access. It's easy to access information. Remember the first point was and m providing information access. And so uh, web and web technology is clearly important. Collaboration, people do without thinking about nowadays, and the most common media are email and increasingly instant messenger. And I think one of the points I would make here is that while people promote all kinds of various technologies, these are examples of technologies that didn't need anybody to push them. They happened. Uh, a lot of the time when it, in the industry people are talking about the next great thing and the next greatest approach, and when, you are, when you're out there trying to sell these things, in fact, you find that you have to push people. And any time you're pushing people to adopt a technology, you have a problem. But I don't really recall anybody out there promoting uh, these tools. In fact, in many ways, they, they, they sell themselves. The third point I made was that uh, decision-making is really critical. And I don't, I'm not really aware of any true decision-making, decision support tools that are available that are, that are being widely deployed, uh, which might be something to think about. So that, those are the themes from a technology perspective and how I'm going to illustrate them is in a review of the pharmaceutical industry and in particular how drugs are discovered and developed within the pharmaceutical industry. And I know there's a mixed background here so I will very quickly go through the stages of that process. It's a staged process. We have to first of all identify a target as it's defined, that is a, a molecule within the body with which a drug interacts uh, to have its effect, its desired pharmacological effect. That has been really the basis of a lot of the bioinformatics work that's gone on in the last few years of defining now that we know, understand the human genome, now that we understand the genes that humans have, and therefore we can deduce the proteins that they're producing. The proteins are the targets of drugs, and so there has been a big change there. Once we've identified possible targets, we have to develop drugs which interact with them. Most drugs, unlike uh, the biotechnology products, proteins, most pharmaceutical drugs are inhibitors that bind to and prevent the action of a particular protein. Uh, those are called leads when you find a, a, a scaffold chemical that has some possible uh, in, interaction. And then you try to optimize it, so that's lead optimization. That's the, really the domain, of course, of chemists. So it starts off with biologists, it passes over to chemists. And then we have to do a lot of work, a preclinical work as it's defined, understanding of the molecules that we've, the chemists have developed really have any, any if they're useful. Uh, how toxic are they? Not a question of whether they're toxic. Anything that has a pharmacological effect inherently has a toxic effect. Uh, but how toxic is it is acceptable. I, ideally, no significant toxicity. Uh, how stable is it? How easy is it to manufacture? How can we formulate? And a lot of other kind of experiments that have many different kind of uh, scientific uh, domains involved. And then we get into the clinical trial process where we actually test drugs on humans uh, in, in a stage process that I'll go into later. Uh, and eventually we have what we believe to be a suitable drug. We apply for permission to market it. And there's a lot of planning that goes on in the pharmaceutical industry in terms of market introduction. It's an expensive process. Which countries are we going to introduce it? How much are we going to charge? Uh, what other, you know, how can we balance it with other drugs that we could be introducing? How's the competition doing? Uh, interesting process. It takes up to five years before a uh, drug is actually introduced. And then we get into the process actually when the drug is on the market, we have to be checking how it's doing. Uh, as you know, there have been a number of instances recently where drugs which were marketed, widely deployed, and then some very undesirable side effects were found in a small subset that never showed up in the original clinical studies. So there's a, a continuing process there. So that's the, you know, what happens in pharmaceutical industry. On average, in, and this is US dollars, not Canadian, 
Uh, the expenditure is $800 million for every pr new drug that gets to market. It's a huge ex expenditure. And worse than that, only one in three of the drugs that get to market actually recoup their historic investment. Uh, and a few of those are what the companies really want, which are described as blockbusters, ones that sell in the sort of multi-billion dollar a year range. Most drugs don't do that, of course. The industry in this environment has had very rapidly growing R&D expenditures on the order of 10, 15% a year compounded for the last decade. On the other hand, the number of new drugs that have come out has not changed significantly. There was a slight bounce a few years ago and it's dropped off again. So the return on investment is clearly decreasing, the productivity is decreasing. And that's set in an, in an environment where there's very strong regulations, where the government is demanding more and more documentation uh, on, on safety and efficacy and more continuing review of the performance of the drug in different markets. Uh, so tremendous cost pressures. In an industry which traditionally has been the most uh, economically successful, highest margin business in the world, uh, but on the other hand is a very risky business. Uh, I remember reading a while ago a, a couple of analogies, both of which I think are fairly appropriate if you want to think about it. One is to the oil industry where people go and drill lots and lots of holes and a few of them give you that gusher that pay for it. And the other kind, the another analogy which is also accurate which you might not think of is Hollywood where most films nowadays are not made by a single group. They're made by a loose consortia that come together for the purpose of making that film and at the end of the film then they, they dis disband and go their separate ways. And the same is true of drugs. You might think that drugs are developed by large pharmaceutical companies but they have many different contributors from biotechnology companies, clinical research organizations, contract manufacturing organizations, clearly hospitals, universities, etc. Huge number of different people involved in a process that spans, and I didn't say this uh, before, I think 10 to 15 years on average to get a drug to market. So that's the background how I'm trying to illustrate and think about the cost pressures and the risk associated with that. Uh, with that. As you heard from Dominic, I'm from OpenText. Hopefully, most of you have heard of OpenText. If you walk out of the building and you look at uh, the Rim uh, Park now, you'll see that there's an OpenText sign. Uh, OpenText is really a Canadian success story, founded in 1991. We were one of the largest software companies in Canada. Uh, it was originally a joint venture in the University of Waterloo to index the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, to, so OpenText developed the first uh, indexing engine which was then applied in the web and one of the claims to fame we have is that we, uh, we were the first search engine that Yahoo used in the early days of the web. The company has changed a lot since then. It's now a global organization. It says 1,100 here. We actually have 1,200 employees as of a few days ago uh, in offices around the world as you see uh, and sales in, uh, in more than 30, uh, 31 countries. We describe ourselves as a, a pioneer in collaborative uh, software, especially in, in the web perspective. Company is unusually financially strong, profitable, continue to, uh, to increase revenues, continue to be profitable, which is very unusual in, in this environment at the moment. Uh, and a large user base, uh, approximately 6 million users of, of our technology and about 4,500 uh, companies. So if you don't know about OpenText, uh, good to learn about it. On the other hand, the building adjacent to the, to the campus, as you'll see, is a very small portion of the company. It is a highly distributed company. It's, for me, been fascinating since I joined the company about two and a half years ago. There are no two sen senior executives in the same location physically. And when you look at companies most of the time trying to consolidate and bring together their groups so that they can work together, this is a company where senior management is totally distributed and where a very significant portion of the staff work from home. I have a home office. We have an office in Richmond Hill I go to occasionally. I'm, we have an office here in Waterloo. I'll be in our Chicago office tomorrow. Uh, so it, it, I think it's perhaps a model of the way things are going in terms of facilitating organizations and, and, and collaboration. This was my tongue-in-cheek, the title I should probably have used rather than the one that I showed you at the beginning. Because what I'm going to do is to try and cover a lot of different areas, which I've certainly been involved in, but that doesn't necessarily I mean that I'm an expert in all of the areas. Uh, and trying to really point out some of, the, some of the thorns, if you like, some of the issues that come up uh, in these different examples. So I'm going to very briefly, in terms of the topics that I address, talk about the information explosions. Contrast information, structured and unstructured. There are some academic definitions and there are some practical definitions of what happens in most companies. And talk about knowledge management, uh, which for some an oxymoron, but uh, certainly uh, uh, a concept that's been around for a while and I think is finally getting some acceptance. And then illustrate those in the number of examples, as I mentioned, from the pharmaceutical industry. 
talking about how we select drug targets, the beginning of that process, uh, an issue about how we manage electronic lab notebooks, which is a fascinating failure. Uh, case story for the last 20 years, it's electronic lab notebooks have failed for 20 years and they continue to fail. Uh, talk about the clinical trial execution process, as, as I described, when we test drugs, we test them on humans, we have to do a clinical trial. And there's an interesting anecdotal uh, story there in terms of how information is captured, how we have to interact with physicians, and the challenges that we have as an industry of getting information from physicians in what are called case support forms. Talk a little bit about the regular su submission process that does involve these huge numbers of documents, uh, and a little bit about uh, project product life cycle, how do we manage these products as they go through these different stages? And one of the significant factors, user roles, and recognizing the different roles that people have in, in organizations and how we need to cater those, to those people in order to have some, uh, some benefit and some success with our software and IT approaches. And then uh, at the end, really, you know, wh where are we going? If, yeah, everybody talks about an information explosion. I, I did a search actually last night to try and uh, see, you know, what, what's the general basis. And you've probably seen this article before by Lyman and Varian. They estimated in the year 2000 that about one to two exabytes, uh, which is a, um, a, a billion gigabytes of information that's novel, unique information produced every year on the Earth. It's about 250 uh, books for every person uh, on the planet. Of course, the real question is, what, you know, how much value is there in there? And this is, uh, they analyze in terms of the different media, optical, paper, film, and magnetic, and most of the information we see is electronic, it's on magnetic media. And most of that information is pretty boring stuff on people's individual uh, PC drives. About 55% of the information sits on drives. It's unique, but who cares, in a sense, other than the person who has it. Uh, but they, uh, we're certainly producing uh, rapidly increasing amounts of information. The same is even true of things like uh, video. There's a lot more film and video uh, in people's personal stores than is actually produced for documentaries and Hollywood productions and so forth. Turning now to you know more, more applicable area, how about biology as an example? Leroy Hood, who's uh, well known in the uh, in the biology area, made a statement a while ago that biology really is an information science, and certainly when you th think about it from a genetics perspective, genetics is about decoding the information within a gene uh, and translating it into a format that humans can understand intellectually uh, rather than actually, you know, I'm, I'm using my own DNA right now, producing parts of my body, I just don't know how I'm doing it. Uh, so how do we translate it? This is a growth in, uh, of GenBank. GenBank is one of the two main repositories of DNA sequence information. Uh, and this data is a little bit old, it goes to the year 2000. As you know, with the Human Genome Sequencing Project, there was a lot more information pushed into that. So very, very clearly, you know, hyper-exponential growth. It will, probably t it will probably drop off, actually. It will not continue in, in, this, in this rate. Because once you've defined what the genetic information is, what, all that's important afterwards is, in fact, the difference. Yeah. And there are very few differences between two individuals. You may be generating a lot of information, most of which you can throw away. And this concept of throwing away information is something I'll come back to. People talk about how huge the human genome is, and it's certainly going to be a project for, you know, foreseeable future decoding that. But if you look at it from an IT perspective, it's interesting. It's a base four code. There are four chemical bases, so it's base four mathematics uh, rather than binary. So you need two bits to, to describe one base. If you were to compress it to that level, which people don't do, they, they turn it into letters and then they put it into, into, you know, uh, into ASCII code, which fills up the database a lot faster. But were you to do that, the entire human genome would fit on a CD approximately. Okay, and that is a level of data compression that I don't think any IT person has ever dreamed of. A complete description of how to make a human being and how to have them operate on one CD. And we will produce you know, probably exabytes of information on just what that means so that we can understand it and comprehend it. Uh, it's an, in an interesting decoding problem. One of the things that I see a lot in involved in, uh, in industry is a big difference between structured and unstructured information. There are classic definitions, as I mentioned. Really, structured information is that which is analyzed. And, classic, and we keep it in databases. So the DNA sequence information I talked about is a very good example of highly structured information. This is the DNA sequence that I got when I sequenced this piece of DNA that I produced in this manner. And there are various fields in the database that describe that uh, information. But most information, and current estimates are more than 80%, is in documents. And those documents are highly unstructured, at least as, as a computer can understand. Uh, there is form within a document, 
Um, so that, for example, italics might mean a title, but they might also mean that I'm emphasizing something. Humans can interpret that. Computers do a lousy job. Uh, what we're seeing is a lot of interest in, in XML. Right now, at least in the pharmaceutical industry, on the other hand, documents are not authored in any form that ends up in XML. So we put them in there, and as you'll see later, a lot of what OpenText has to do is, is provide search and retrieval tools that look within the text to find out what people are interested in and to profile common interests and so on. The hope is that things will be pre-tagged, uh, that we'll know that this section is a subheading, that this relates in a pharmaceutical uh, example as a description of a drug, this is the, this is the dose, and these are the results, uh, etc. If I look from a research and development perspective, how can we divide up, uh, you know, how, how do we see the differences in information? And what you'll see is you go to a typical pharmaceutical or biotechnology company, they have a lot of databases. Uh, they're all acronyms here, but they have uh, databases related to gene sequence, to clinical trial results, to what happened when we tested the drug on a patient, uh, to things that they did in the QA lab, to things that they did in high-throughput screening. This is when you throw a million or 10 million chemical compounds in a rapid assay to determine any, if any of those compounds interact with your biological target. And there has been a lot of interest in the last little while in terms of integrating that data, uh, which in large measure isn't really very important. Uh, and so you'll see people trying to come up with a consolidated uh, data architecture that allows you to accommodate all of this different kind of data. By the time they figured out that architecture and tried to build it, somebody has come up, uh, you know, and IT people always complain about this, these damn scientists, they've come up with some new technology and some new data that they want to save. So you're never able to do that. And as I'll come back to later, in fact, it really doesn't matter. What's missing here is, is what we do with that data and the context and the knowledge that we derive from it. So we do have that data. We can query and we can report on it. Most of the time, though, the data is actually analyzed with various scientific applications, whether it's statistical analysis or molecular modeling or gene sequence comparisons and so on, a wide range of different applications that analyze the raw data. By the same token, as I mentioned, most of the data is actually unstructured. Uh, and so it's in things like patents and what the competition are doing and monthly reports that we wrote. And one of the things that you hear all the time in the pharmaceutical industry of the IT department complaining these damn scientists keep using Excel spreadsheets. You know, I created this wonderful database for them and then they go and create this spreadsheet. Because scientists love that because you can basically rapidly create a, a, an environment to put the data and to have it automatically analyzed. And, you know, I'm going to be doing a different experiment tomorrow and I'll need some different spreadsheets, so why try and standardize it? So there is a lot of that. Uh, but ultimately, we would like to make all that available in some kind of a knowledge repository that we can act on it. And if you look at knowledge management, there has been a classic triangle that people talk about. So at the bottom, there's lots of quantity on the side, lots of data, which we, uh, from which we extract some meaning, we get some information, and then we have some knowledge that we can understand, something we understand. And some people put at the top level wisdom. You know, when I've done this a number of times, they actually get good at doing this. And most of the focus, as I mentioned, in organizations tends to be on the data level. That thought of integration and consolidation and consistency and so forth. And very little thought is actually given to how we, how we derive knowledge. So if you look at classic knowledge management theory, it's really about getting the right knowledge to the right people at the right time with you know, various tools to do that. And there are two sort of views. One is that you can capture that. This object is knowledge is a thing. Okay, I did not know this, now I know this, I've got this knowledge object. And if I gave it to you, you'd have the same knowledge. The other perspective is it's really a process. Yeah. That we need to be able to be doing things, acting on that information, driving this knowledge. And it's really what we do that's more important than this thing that I create. And I think both, both views are probably correct. No presentation is you know, complete without a, without a deal. But, um, and so a few years ago, and it's interesting that this, this was copyrighted in 1998, knowledge management was a pretty hot topic. Uh, and that was certainly true in the pharmaceutical industry. You know, people were promoting the concept of knowledge management. And it sounded great. And one of the first things that we saw, you know, I was running a company that was promoting knowledge management and informatics in the pharmaceutical industry. And we would get people calling up. I've just been promoted, moved over put out to pasture, you know, your interpretation, as the Vice President of Knowledge Management in Pharmaceutical Company X, what is it? <laughs> and usually this was some former scientist who's kind of getting tired and they kind of put him over there. So first of all, he has absolutely no respect in the organization because he's not a real scientist like the rest of us and he's been stuck over there. And secondly, they didn't give him a budget. 
So these were great people to talk to. They were trying to figure out what you were talking about, who had absolutely no bu mu uh, budget to buy what you were selling. Uh, and it was a little bit of a frustrating time uh, you know, as, a, as a company trying to sell that. But coming back now, we're seeing people actually adopting knowledge management. But I, uh, what I always tell our salespeople is to never use the term. Okay, talk about you know, your business process and what's important and running things better and making better decisions, but never talk about knowledge management. Because that's a devalued term based upon the experience from a few years ago. I used this slide a few years ago. I was looking at some of my old slides, and I got people from companies coming and saying, can I have that? So this is what used to be the case a few years ago in the academic uh, approach. You have a, you're familiar with it. You have a graduate student working diligently in a lab, doing lots of experiments, writing the data down in their lab notebook, maybe, and then analyzing it. And then they come to their supervisor, and they say, you know, I, ha I have, uh, uh, you know, I found the following thing, and the supervisor Great stuff. You know, we've got to publish a paper. So they work on the paper. Or more, you know, the student works on the paper, goes through several drafts, etc., and ultimately gets it published, as you know. And the paper, of course, not only it doesn't have the data in it. It has the analysis of the data. It has a few tables, the key results. Uh, it has a background and a context, the introduction, and that's important. What does this mean? How does it fit into what we already know? And it has some hypotheses based on what I've just found. What, what's going to happen? Pretty standard stuff. And, of course, papers are published, and then people write reviews. So it's a higher level of analysis. Looking at all of these different papers, what can we really think is true? You know, what does this mean? Where are the trends? And so on. If you look on the corporate approach, in, they're basically doing the same thing. They're getting more data. It's usually technicians this time that are paid to do this as a full-time job. They're analyzing it. And sometimes they generate internal reports. Pretty, you know, very common in industry to produce a monthly report. This month, my team did the following things. It has some context, it has some, some background. But what happens is, first of all, on the corporate side, there's typically no equivalent to a review. There's no higher level of analysis that goes on. And on the academic side, all of that stuff disappears. If you go to a lab a few years later, after the graduate student has left, and ask their supervisor, what did Joe Smith do when he was there? He will reach over and pull the reprint. Joe Smith did the following. Ask him for the raw data. I don't know. It's gone. In the lab, what may or may not be there, but even if it is there, I can't find the stuff. It's not important. What is important is what came out of that, what did it mean, and you know, so it's usually in that scientific paper. What the industry spent a lot of time doing was making sure that we never lost the data, so we built these humongous big databases with tons and tons of data in them. And even the monthly reports that are typically produced that extracted some meaning and context are usually lost. When I go to pharmaceutical companies, I usually say, can you produce for me your monthly project reports from six months ago? And the answer is not easily, which means not at all. Uh, so they don't really manage what's extracted from this stuff that they pay a lot of money to create. So what are the typical issues about running a project in these, in these organizations? Firstly, there is usually no central uh, uh, repository. Maybe there shouldn't be, but there's no coordinated way to, uh, to manage the information. But more importantly, team members usually can't find what they need. You have to have somebody to tell you where the thing is. Uh, and there's a lack of historical perspective. One of the most important things is we may have all of this data. Why do we have this data? What were we looking at? What were we thinking about at the time? And what were we trying to do? And you can see that if a key individual goes, typically the project leader, the, you know, the company doesn't know how to behave or respond. Then why are we doing what we were doing? And you know, I, I've forgotten the reasons now. And what happens in an environment that the pharmaceutical industry has, which is one of making sure that we kill most projects, as I showed you, the statistics at the beginning, most projects are going to fail. You know, only one in three drugs will actually get money back. In fact, the numbers are something like 10,000 molecules are studied for any one that gets to the market. So you have a culture where the aim is really to save money by making sure we kill these things as quickly as possible. And so what usually happens is I don't think there's ever a drug that's gone to market that hasn't been canceled at least twice. And I make that comment, and people, and when I'm in industry, usually say that's three times in our company. And so what happens is, you know, I've been, I had this great idea. I got some support in the company. I built up this team. We were heading to the market. We had this great opportunity. Some guy in some other company had this potential competitor, and the senior management looked at it and said, you know, we're too late. Kill the project. And I got so pissed off I left. And then six months later, the competitor's project fails, as most of them do, and then they say, you know, we should restart that project. And what happens in the pharmaceutical company is the project lead is gone. He was the one that really knew what was happening. It was very hard to restart that project, and they're probably set back by two years by a six-month hiatus. 
And then one of the things that you find, the industry the statistics are on the order of one to three million dollars per day is saved by getting to market earlier. So if you get to market one day early, you can save one to three million dollars on average. It should be something that you're trying to do very quickly. And yet, what, we're going to go through a process in a few minutes. If you have to make a series of decisions along the way. Meetings are held to make decisions and they're scheduled months in advance. Yeah. Would it not be a good idea to have the meeting when we're actually you know, ready to make the, the decision? I'll come back to that. But that could pro save the industry more money than probably anything else that they do. So, you know, how can we address this? One is that there needs to be an appropriate process. How do we change the way that people behave? How do they work together? And it requires the organizations to, have, uh, to, to promote cultural change, first of all. And this is the biggest issue of all, is get people to accept working, to, working together, working differently. And you know, this is my kick at the academic organizations. The culture for most people who come from an academic, from an academic graduate background is, you know, I'm the star, I did this myself, I won't tell anybody until I've really found this great thing, and then I'll tell everybody. And you know, most organizations that do research have completely the opposite. I want a team player who will tell everybody. I was in a biotechnology company where I started a project, and I kid you not, somebody who joined from a large pharmaceutical company who had this kind of uh, ori orientation uh, held a, a held a project meeting with senior management and I was not invited because I might tell somebody what was happening. Anyway, so that's very important. If the, if the company is not prepared to, or the organization is not prepared to change the way they're doing things, no amount of throwing IT at it will, will make the slightest bit of difference, of course. It's doomed to failure. Uh, if that happens, then you need to select the appropriate environment. It's likely going to be heterogeneous. There's no single solution that meets everything. Uh, but it, we need to define it, architect it, so that the appropriate components that do what needs to be done. Now, if you look at the general market for knowledge management, there are a number of different tools like Groupware, which help people work together. Lotus Notes was a good example. It's, uh, uh, an industry analyst told me a few weeks ago that Lotus Notes is, is the most ripped out product in the pharmaceutical industry right now, uh, m most, most frequently removed. Contact management, which sounds like you ha help salespeople, it's really how does the organization know about who outside the organization it's interacting with and what the last interaction was and how can we do a better job and so forth. Various kinds of databases and intranets, data warehousing, document management systems. First message here is these are fragmented and different solutions to the same general problem. And this is uh, something that we found uh, in open text is that we have been promoting the concept of a collaborative knowledge management environment, but one of the biggest problems is if you tell somebody that they need to do more work than they're currently doing, it's not a very successful strategy. If you tell an, an example of a research organization, some technician that's putting 50 files a day in, in some server, and you say, I need you to write a report, I also need you to put the files somewhere else, they say, forget it, I'm not interested. So you really have to think about what are they doing in their job, what IT tools, IT tools are they using, and make it, if anything, easier for them to do what you want them to do than it was in the past. Not one iota harder, you're going to get considerable resistance. So really think about the tools that people are using, be it to collaborate or just to do their analysis, and automate those tools so that you're capturing the information that you, that you need. Uh, so ideally, then, you have this interaction. People have an information repository from which they can get information that supports them doing their job as they're doing their job, information is populated back into the information repository. When I showed you some of the tools that are applicable uh, to, to knowledge management, um, I made the comment they're fragmented. Recently, Gartner Research, which, which analyzes IT trends, uh, made, you know, made the statement that there is now developing a concept of smart enterprise suites. Single tools from single vendors that do all of these different things together. Uh, and that's certainly happening. That's a, a reflection of the maturity. So there are going to be, in the end, a few vendors that sell tools that do all of these things, uh, rather like there are a few vendors of database technology and a few vendors of email technology. The same will be true. And what you need to do is to manage your content, the stuff that you've created in whatever form it is. You need to provide access by any, any route. doesn't matter whether it's computer, cell phone, or whatever. You need to be able to find the stuff that's in there, various kinds of retrieval technologies, and as I've highlighted in yellow, you need to facilitate the people, the way that people interact together while they're working in that environment. Uh, and so, if you look at open text in this example, we have what we call a collaborative knowledge management system. It's fundamentally a document and records management system on a database with a lot of tools that support the way that people work. 
Recognizing this trend, we've more recently bought a company that does um, uh, messaging. So they integrate voicemail, uh, email, uh, text, video, etc., on kind of messaging functions. We bought a company that does rich media in terms of integrating what I'm doing right now of giving a presentation. So it has video, it has text, it has voice, all as a single uh, object which can be managed and shared with people. Um, and we bought companies that have portal technology which allows you to access multiple repositories at the same time. So we certainly believe in this uh, trend to smart enterprise suites. And You'll, you know, this is true from the horizontal perspective across all industries. It's true of healthcare and so on. People don't always recognize it. What I find is I work in different verticals. That, that people think that their problems are completely unique. They will buy initially from a software vendor who, provide, who just sells to that industry, who speaks their language and who has that product. In the end, though, they're not going to want that solution because it's going to be a niche product from a company that ultimately will fail and that kind of technology will be broadly applicable. So you would not now buy a database technology from a company that only addresses healthcare. Uh, if they don't use Oracle, for example, or they don't use Microsoft SQL Server as their underlying platform. And the same will probably be happening in smart enterprise suites. So when I talk about cloud tools, there are a wide range of them uh, that are listed here, and you're going to see some examples of them as I, uh, as I go through the, uh, my specific examples. So, Going back to that diagram of the stages of pharmaceutical research and development, the first stage, you remember, was target selection and identification. Great opportunity. We now know the 30 to 40,000, see, 30 to 40,000 we know. We have a pretty good idea of the human genes that exist and the proteins that are produced from them, and those are the potential targets. Only some 10% is the current estimate could ever be targets for drug intervention. These are quotations from a recent genomics symposium. So the big challenge now is not getting that data, but what we do with it, identifying what is a good target. And that, the problem is there's a, a, a glut that we never had in the past. Traditionally, when somebody discovered a new gene, you know, everybody would jump on it because there was a shortage of genes. Now we've all got the same genes. It's a question of you know, which is the better one. And so for the first time, we actually have to have contribution from a lot of different people. And we have to have an iterative process. We can't be waiting for a new thing to be published in science that we never saw before. We now all have the knowledge of the same genes. What we have to be doing is re reviewing on an iterative basis what we know about those genes and how it's developing, what new information is created, is published in the medical and scientific literature that would lead us to believe there's an opportunity here that nobody else has spotted. So it's really a team-based approach. They have to look not only on, well, you know, what is the gene, but what do we know about it? What other approaches to treating the disease are there? So what other targets could there be? Why is this one better? What's the potential for therapeutic benefit? What's the potential for side effects? What are the competition doing? Are there patents that block us from doing that? Clearly a contribution from a lot of different people with a lot of different skills and expertise. And how do you manage that in a process that it isn't just totally random or you know, whatever, uh, whatever you know, uh, appeals to people? I talked about this a while ago in a, pharma, in a actually a biotechnology company and tried to get them to think rationally about how do you manage the review of these opportunities. have got 30,000 genes, there's probably only 300 of particular interest to them, how do we review 300 genes? And they were not interested, again, this cultural thing in ha any kind of organized process. Oh, you might miss something. Well, how do you do it? Well, we go to scientific meetings and we talk in the hallway. And if you didn't go to the scientific meeting, well, you wouldn't have had that finding. What about, do you go to every meeting? No. Do you talk in every hallway? No. But that's the way I do it. Well, wouldn't it make sense at least to pre-screen the candidates to say on the criteria that you're looking for, these look better than these ones? Because you can't look at them all. Why not look at the ones with some uh, basis of being more attractive? Didn't want to do that. So this is uh, an example of a workflow editor. You can define the steps, and this, this is an example in target selection that I was involved in a few years ago, of looking in the databases, what do we know about the protein, what do we know about the nucleic acid, what do we know about the stages. And this is a way that organizes what, who does what, when, and as a consequence of what they have done, branches, who, should, uh, who else should look at it. It's not only that process sequence, but what are the tools that are available? One of the biggest challenges in many of the organizations is we have all kinds of analytic tools that people don't even know we bought. You know, where are the tools? And there's a lot of stuff on the internet. One of the biggest challenges I had in the bioinformatics days was that there was so much stuff that was free, nobody would buy anything. You know, we had this great software, and they said, this is great, but you know, I can get it for free because it's heavily subsidized by the government on these various internet sites. Uh, so it destroyed a whole bioinformatics industry. 
uh, bioinformatics as an industry right now is essentially dead. Which is great because you guys have a bioinformatics program. I hope nobody's in it. Anyway, um, so this is an example. I had a particular step. These are the, tool, the best tools available, and they're all hyperlinks, and you click on them and you go to them. And then you, the next person, after you've done your work, the next person is informed uh, there's a task waiting for you. And this is one of the challenges right now that email is becoming so devalued that you can't be notified by email anymore because you wouldn't pay attention to it. So is there a place that really gives you high value in the sense of here are my consolidated tasks on all the things that I'm working on and I know that, that this is uh, up to date and I don't have to be trying to sort and filter my email. And then not only is there a design of the process but there's a tracking of the process and in this one you see things at yellow hours going through that that step has been done and, and there are blue X's on the steps that were not passed because it went down another path. And you can look at it on, on, on steps and so on. One of the things that I don't mention it is that uh, very important now in this industry which is so heavily regulated, you have to know who did what when all of the time. So audit trails are becoming very important. I mentioned I talk about lab notebooks briefly. So it really has impact on those, uh, the stages where we're, we're doing a lot of stuff in the lab. The target identification increasingly is, is a literature database search uh, and less of a lab based search. And we implemented LiveLink at uh, Abbott as an example as a lab notebook repository. But I've been involved in a lot of companies that are thinking about lab notebooks. And the first thing you find is that there's no consensus between companies of what a lab notebook is. Some people have ring bindings and some people have thermally bound and everybody requires that you have a witness sign a page and you X out the portions. That's consistent. But on the other hand, you have a company that has a scientist with very different backgrounds. And so as a biologist, when I, I used to have, use a lab notebook, I would enter, you know, what is the purpose of the experiment? What are the results that I found? What does it mean? Chemists don't use lab notebooks like that. Uh, they record their synthesis protocol and the yield that they had at a given stage, etc. And I made that comment at GE, actually. I was at the GE Central Research Center a while ago. And the guy in the audience says, I'm a physicist. I just start writing. So there's no consistency of how a lab notebook is used. And I said, well, it doesn't really matter. You've got to fundamentally you have a database that has very comprehensive query reporting t uh, tools. Why not put all these results into a database? If you want to represent them as a book in terms of, you know, show me all the experiments I did in chronological order, it's the same as a book. Didn't get it. Because the lab notebook tools right now are PC-based ones and they look like lab notebooks. So I got really frustrated. We can actually skin our product to make it look like anything. So I was getting a little silly, but I made it look like a, a book. And people love that because, in fact, the lab notebook products, generally speaking, have pages that turn. You know, and that was, the, that was the piece that was missing for them. I've got a paper lab notebook, give me an electronic equivalent. They were not thinking about the issues about data storage and retrieval and recovery and all the stuff that makes sense. That I said, we have all of that stuff. They were thinking about, you know, could I write on the page? Yeah, sure, we'll give you a box, type in the box. Behind the scenes, what's happening is, in fact, there's a version control of this, doc, of this text document. Every time they hit, you know, add a version, it's, so we've got complete audit trail and we know exactly when they enter that information. And they want to drag and drop, so, because I've got my Excel stuff, so can I, can I drag my Excel spreadsheet over and so on, so, you know. This was never intended to sell it, but it was just to make a point that you, the technology is there, it's just a question of presentation. Then clinical trial management. This is where the real money is. There are, people think that the pharmaceutical industry spends most money in the clinic. In fact, they don't. They spend most money in the early stages of the process, but most of those projects fail. By the time we get to the clinic, as I mentioned, 15% of this huge number, at least 15%, will get out of the other end. Okay. So, and we, clinical t trials can cost millions to tens of million dollars a trial. Uh, and we have to do an average of about 60 worldwide to get uh, market approval for a given pharmaceutical. So it's a complex process. We implemented uh, this at Pfizer, which is the largest pharmaceutical company in the world, where what they were trying to do was collect information uh, during the conduct of uh, studies within a, within a clinic. So this is the big challenge. You probably think that uh, pharmaceutical companies do clinical studies to support their drug. No, they don't. They're done by hospitals uh, who in the U.S. compete to get clinical trials because they're, you know, they're, they're lucrative. Physicians, of course, meet with the patients and they get the information from the patients. They get that information on what are called case report forms. And 80 to 90 percent of right now of, of that information is on paper. And this is a big issue about acceptance that when I go to a physician and he says, how are you feeling today? You know, and nowadays I'm used to kind of opening up you know, a, a binder and he writes a, or a file and writes some stuff on there, some notes. But most of the time he's paying attention to me. And there's a lot of resistance of physicians to use electronic entry. And a lot of resistance on the patient's side, pay attention to me, stop 
typing away while I'm talking to you. you know, I don't mind you doing this, but you know, I don't like it when you're trying to enter or you're touching things on a screen, etc. So the reality is right now that information that we have to get is on paper. And I don't have time to go into it, but there is a sort of a 15-year history of failure of trying to electronicize, uh, if that was a word, uh, clinical trials. Various approaches. Pharmaceutical companies used to pay for laptops for every physician involved in a study. The physicians would have six different laptops with different programs on each one, and it, to hell with it. Yeah. And the biggest issue is what happened, you know, if I've got this piece of paper from the physician, if there's any misunderstanding, I can call him back and get this whole data clarification process. As we try to do it electronically, if he makes a mistake, there's no recourse. And the regulatory authorities, like the Food and Drug Administration in the States, demand that you have the original source information. And if the physician records it on paper, gives it to a clerk who keys it into the computer, and then throws the paper away, we haven't got source information. So the pharmaceutical companies traditionally have wanted those case report forms. And so this is the process that had to be put in place of getting these case report forms rapidly, getting them into the systems. They use a product called Oracle Clinical for most clinical analysis. Uh, so they need it in the database to actually s to, to look at the safety and efficacy of drugs and to do that quickly. Um, and then be able to do the analysis and submit to the regulatory authorities. Now, this is what's happening with the largest pharmaceutical company using, using our technology. The single key thing that's really important here is getting hold of these case report forms. We've sold recently to two of the largest clinical research organizations. These are ones that actually do the clinical studies for the pharmaceutical companies. They have millions of case report forms a year. And they, have they, they span the globe as organizations, generally speaking. And you talk to them, a person, I have to see this case report form. I'm the medical reviewer. I'm looking at the medical aspects of this study. So I need to look at the original data. It's these case report forms. Somebody else is doing data entry. Somebody else is doing safety analysis, etc. And they all have to look at this paper. They cannot find it. It's a massive tracking problem. So the single most important value for them is to convert that paper to an electronic image of the paper, never mind electronic forms, so that anybody in the world can pull it up because we have a central repository of these images. And then we can treat it the way we've always treated it. And so what we were involved in is, here's the database where the data ultimately gets extracted to. At the beginning of that process is the paper. Sometimes now increasingly it's, it's electronic, electronic data capture. But now we have to treat them the same. We have a hybrid environment. If I want to look at the patient information, it should not matter to me whether it used to be paper or it's electronic, I need a single view of that. And so we have various tools to support that process. At Pfizer, this is how it's implemented. They call it the Electronic Trial Master File System. Uh, back in November, they reported they had 13 million uh, objects in the system, 80 plus percent of which are case report forms. They're adding about 3 million a year uh, in that system. And we've got clinical research organizations much bigger than, that, bigger than Pfizer because they're doing clinical studies for many pharmaceutical companies. Huge amounts of data uh, being managed in a process that what they're doing is really structuring it. I have a given drug that I'm testing according to an experimental protocol. I do it in certain clinical centers and this, to the centers come patients. And a patient visits many times. I need to organize the information according to each visit. Here's a data, uh, uh, case report form for each visit. Here's a lab report for the visit, etc. Uh, and down at that level. And so through navigating our system, you can get that information. So here is an example of all of the visits by a patient. And the system is creating the names. You can't have humans creating, you know. So they're tracking names automatically created. They're validated against the database of the correct patients and studies, etc. But you'll notice there, there's a little PDF object, a case book. Because now I've got potentially hundreds of files for a given patient. It's not convenient for me to pull up hundreds of files from the system. So the system is auto-publishing a compound PDF document, which has a, a table of contents. And as you can see, this is clearly a scanned image. And I simply click on those bookmarks in the PDF on, and go to the appropriate page, no matter what my role is. To manage this process, and this is only one page, this is how we organize uh, metadata in LiveLink. There are a lot of different metadata fields, approximately 40. So this one image has 40 metadata fields which talk about status, where did it come from, uh, what, you know, are there any issues outstanding, what does it relate to, and, and, and so forth. And so then we support the ability to, to, to search that where we can look at system attributes, the things that the system creates, you know, who authored it and when was it done, et cetera, type of document. And then metadata which was designed for the specific system, such as what kind of case report form is it, what kind of document category is it. And then we can search for keywords either in the text of the document itself or in the metadata. 
and the other side of it is to, do, is to execute a report. There are workflow tools, as I showed you. Pfizer gave up on workflow tools because there were too many exceptions to the, all of the planned thing, approaches. So their approach was to say, okay, there are different people with different jobs. We give them the appropriate tools and they can query the system and say, you know, which things are waiting for me to do? Given my role, the interest in this drug and this protocol, what's waiting for me to work on it? Uh, and so the, actually, basically, this is a query tool on LiveLink where they fill in the protocol, the, uh, the center and the patient, and it comes back and says, these are the things waiting for you to do something. And there are immediately action items available uh, for those objects. And there are all these different roles. You think about the whole overall process of people with different roles that need different tool sets. And so when they get into the system, what they do is they log into the system, sorry, they, they log into the system and say, okay, you know, and the system actually remembers, but you know, this is my role, and if I have this role, then it presents you with a set of tools appropriate to that role. So if I'm managing the data center, here I can review the, uh, the pages that are waiting for data entry according to different criteria, as you see. As I mentioned earlier, okay, we've done all this clinical trial stuff. You know, we have a lot of information saying this is a great drug. I want to take it to market. What I have to do is make a submission to regulatory authorities. Uh, as you heard at the beginning, first of all, each country has different regulatory authorities. Health Protection Branch here in Canada, the Therapeutic Products Directorate. Uh, in the US, it's the Food and Drug Administration. They have CEDA and CEBA. They're kind of arguing about whether things are drug or biological, and CEDA is winning on that one. But a new drug application, which is the largest of the many different submissions, there are hundreds of thousands of submissions literally made a year in the US from everything about, can I have permission to change this label to blue from red and this kind of stuff? You have to submit every label change which is fairly trivial, to a new drug application, which is the biggest and the fewest uh, that go on. Typically, on the order of half a million to two million pages in a new drug application, uh, between five and 800 documents right now, which is growing rapidly. And more importantly, to help the reviewers look at that, there's an average of, right now, runs about 50,000 links between the documents. So when I'm looking at this document, which is clinical report summary, and I want to see a table that's in another section, I just click on a hyperlink and it takes me right there. Because traditionally, a new drug application was loaded into a semi-truck. I mean, there were a stack of documents like this and you had to send 20 copies to each agency and of course the formats were tif different, etc. So, bigger in, and there were pictures of the FDA had they had to reinforce the floor to hold all of the papers. So they really want you to go to electronic. Um, but on the other hand, they have a lot of viewers who make comments like, I, you know, I was 15 years in medical school. I didn't go to medical school to learn how to operate a computer. Um, so the FDA has a lot of problems and it's the same is true in Canada. But what we're seeing happening is, I've talked about that process where we're generating information at in each of the stages. We have to extract from at each of those stages the information and put it into these various submissions, including a new application. But it's only a subset of the information that we have. These systems you know, track all kinds of stuff which is totally irrelevant, all the projects that failed, all of the pizza parties we had on Friday afternoon. Uh, and so what is the information that's particularly relevant? On the other hand, we can't be accused of hiding any smoking gun that would have disqualified the drug. Uh, so we need a mechanism by which we extract the information from our corporate system, put it in the submission. And traditionally it used to be paper, increasingly becoming electronic, but what, what we're seeing now is that paper process used to be a batch process. You, know, you can talk to anybody in the industry. When they were approaching an NDA deadline, they stayed up all night or till 3 o'clock in the morning for two weeks, you know, and they had the boardroom laid out with all the paper and they were managing it, and then they were done, thank God. You know, and they go home and they sleep for a few weeks. Uh, there's an electronic equivalent right now, but what's starting to happen is this is becoming a rolling process. Why wait? Here's some of the information I have. I'll be sending you the rest later, and you can do that electronically. And so what has traditionally happened is when you're putting a submission together, you create it, all of the content, the 500 documents that are going to be components, you assemble them, which is no mean task, and organize them. This, they go in the appropriate sections, they're all requirements about how the things should be formatted, etc. And then you publish them as this big submission. And, uh, and then you do a lot of QA on it because you don't want any of these links to be broken, you don't want things to be missing and you know, pages that are screwed up and so on. So there used to be document management systems like LiveLink that would pass it over to these publishing applications. But increasingly we're seeing happening, in fact, and now a standardization of format, there's something called the electronic common technical document format. So NDAs increasingly have some degree of standardization. It's not as good as it sounds. But there's an inter international conference on harmonization saying for new drug applications in most of the major countries, do it according to this standard format, not different format for each country. And you can do it electronically, and so it's now starting to be a very different kind of a process. So you're really taking an information hierarchy you have in your 
document management system and porting it over to a system uh, that can be reviewed. There's some interesting stuff going on there. Traditionally, the, pharmaceutical uh, the regulatory authorities would receive the submission on a truck and then they received it on magnetic tape. And so the industry, while it may have now a standard format, still has to cut different CDs and tapes according, you know, the Japan doesn't want more than 50 megs on a, on a, you know, everybody has different standards for the media. And in Europe right now, 15 European countries, eight cannot receive electronic submissions because they don't have the infrastructure to receive them. The IT infrastructure simply doesn't exist and the government isn't giving them money to, to create it. So the major pharmaceutical companies are promoting a, are promoting a concept called the infobroker. Go to other industries. There are trusted third parties in the banking industry, for example. Trillions of dollars a day pass through these between different banks. They go through a central authority. Same is true of Visa and MasterCard, etc. Nothing new. Pharmaceutical industry is saying, why don't we do the same thing? Let's have a single environment, very tightly controlled, tight security, uh, where we, the pharmaceutical companies, can put information in here and where the regulatory authorities can review it. And we can put updates and we can collaborate essentially over the internet very securely. Uh, through this repository. And, you know, the pharmaceutical thinking, companies think it's great. The little companies say, well, you'll put us at a tremendous disadvantage because we won't be able to, you know, we can't manage this kind of stuff. And they're saying, no, no, this will all be subsidized. And, and the regulatory authorities say, hmm, well, we've never done it like this before. So it'll probably be another 15 years before we do it, but it's probably inevitable. So what's happening on the collaborative front here is that we have more, larger teams of people with much larger submissions they're becoming more complex with more components, more interrelationships, and tighter deadlines. And so we really need to control the process, especially as we sw switch from here's a big submission to here's a rolling submission, where response times have to decrease, but the complexity is much more important. So very clearly it needs to be automated. We need collaborative and IT tools to support that so that we don't miss deadlines. One well, of the pharmaceutical companies implemented LiveLink simply to make sure that they responded to queries from regulatory authorities. They missed one. Usually what happens is you know, when you have a drug before review, they'll, they'll send you a registered letter and say, we have a query about this, please respond in the next 48 hours or something like that. And this company did not respond on a timely basis. That reset the clock on the whole review at $3 million a day. That's a very expensive proposition. The CEO said, this will never happen again, will it? Go get a tool, and they bought LiveLink to do that, just to manage that. So every query that comes into that company is registered, and they have a process by which they respond to it. And here's some examples of those different kinds of collaborative tools. Ad hoc tasking. You may have a defined process, but what if I want to ask Shirley to do something? I could send her an email. Did she get it? Has she looked at it? What's the status? You know, task lists are increasingly important in, in that application. You can have well, structure the process in a formal workflow. As I say, it can break down on very complex situations where they're never reproduced. You can have discussion groups, uh, common themes, you know, and discussion groups are widely you know, used on the internet, etc., and becoming more increasingly used in companies because we know there's a place to go where you can look at a history. Most people are not saving their emails. In fact, in a pharmaceutical company, typically it's 90 days that the email has to be purged unless you explicitly done something and put it somewhere. You cannot keep it for longer than that because there may be a lot of stuff we don't want to know about. Uh, so you, there's a, a strict policies about that. You know, polling. Uh, when we first added that polling function to the live, like I was pretty skeptical, but increasingly I'm seeing people actually, okay, what's the general consensus? I could send an email to each of you and you could send part of it back and we could flood the email just asking the question about, you know, what kind of uh, format do we want to support? much easier to say just vote and you've got the next three days to vote and if you don't vote too bad you don't have an input because not all things are done by top-down decisions uh, in fact very few as it turns out in most organizations and then you can look at the you know, uh, reports on that for me one of the most important things in a system like this is automatic notification as more and more information is going into the system I cannot afford to be looking I cannot simply look at the whole system you know, internal open text uh, system right now has several million documents I can't be tracking them all so I tell the system, and I have in this case three, three uh, intelligent agents, what I want to know about and how I want to be told and how frequently I'm told about it. Uh, and so there are things happening on the enterprise uh, and then I can point it to specific objects. And I get reports at the frequency that I want telling me things that these things have happened. And so this is a typical example. You know, things have happened in this project to consolidate a report. And whenever you say that, by the way, when you're out in front of customers, and they say, it sends emails. Does it send one for every event? No, no, it's consolidated and they're all hyperlink. God, <laughs> big issue with most people. 
One of the other areas that's interesting is we have a tool called Meeting Zone, which supports meetings. Now, a lot of people are familiar with tools like WebEx and Centra, where you can have a virtual meeting. Yesterday, I was involved in three different meetings, one in Indianapolis, uh, one in Boston, I think, uh, and one I got it, don't even know where it was. And everybody involved in the meeting was, and these were with two pharmaceutical companies and a packaging company. And everybody involved in the meeting from outside, you know, were all over the place. So this is becoming much more pervasive. I'm an elite flyer on Air Canada. I flew 55 uh, flights last year. I think I've flown 10 maybe this year. It's really dropping from Air Canada. But I mean, it's, it's, these things are having a big impact. That you're familiar with the virtual meetings. What has really been interesting to me is how this changed the dynamics of a physical meeting. Within our company, we use this for physical meetings. It's a meeting support tool so that people come to the meeting pre-prepared so that they take notes and so that they can do things like chatting to each other during the meeting. We have an alliance with a, another software company and about 10 of us went to our Chicago office for this big meeting. And we were using our meeting tool, they were not. And they were used to the idea, I'm sitting here, I'm listening, there's a guy up there talking. Meanwhile, everybody's doing this, you know, in, in an, an open text. And what they're doing is, do you believe what he said? Do you agree with that? Is he right? You know, All the kind of stuff that you would normally do like this, I can now do with people in the meeting. And the dynamics of the meeting have changed. It's quite fascinating how, how that's happening physical meetings, not these uh, virtual meetings. So we, you know, we support all these kinds of things. Who is involved, kind of, you know, we can assign tasks to people, we can have discussions, we can work on a whiteboard. Importantly though, at the end of the meeting, uh, all of that stuff is saved in XML and can, can be available. Uh, so that when you're doing a search, you find out that we had a meeting three weeks ago where these things were discussed. Uh, and you can also reconvene the meeting, what meeting ever does what it's supposed to do. So we resume where we left off, the agenda items are preserved, the things that we were working on are preserved, etc. So I've been talking about you know, these different stages. One of the key elements is we have to make decisions at each step of the way. And I mentioned that to you that companies are putting in place an environment that made that very tight. So we need, what information do we need to collect at a given stage and what are the criteria to make that decision? It's amazing when you ask companies, Okay, these are very important decisions that you make. How do you make it? Well, we all get together and we talk about it. And what are the criteria? What's consistent? They don't think that way yet, uh, but clearly the tools can support it. Uh, and ideally, and this is a dream right now, you actually have a meeting. We've got all of the information that we said we need to make the decision. Let's have a meeting tomorrow, not three months from now when it's regularly scheduled. Biggest challenge is that everybody's calendar is full tomorrow, uh, but that would be uh, more effective. And for collecting that information, how do we collect it? This is a lot of the work that our professional services group do is, okay, I've got a place to put stuff. How do we standardize the organization, the taxonomy, and so forth? Because what we're really doing here is they are generating data with various tasks in the lab that have various components to each of these steps that have reports and conclusions. I'm really talking about operating at that knowledge level to make decisions. I don't really care about this, provided the people working on this did the right things and I trust them. One of the important aspects of this is when you talk to people is do you believe what Mary said or Joe said? You know, there's a lot of context associated here with that. The information is the same coming from two people but I don't believe one and I believe the other and it makes a big difference in decision making. And one of the things that certainly in pharmaceutical companies people have always wanted is some kind of a concept of a, of a cockpit. Senior management knows what's going on. I was at one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world a few years ago and the head of research did not know how many research projects he had. He could not find out how many research projects that were going on in his organization. That was information not available to him. There was another one of the companies and they had paid a consulting company a lot of money to build this kind of query tool. The biggest problem with the query tool is there's nothing to query. If the people doing their job are not putting information into a place that the senior manager can ask the question, what's the average length of a project? You know, if I don't have project information, when was it started and when was it finished, I can't ask the question, what's the average length? And tell me the ones that are 2x over the average period or spent 2x of budget or something because those are the ones, you know, nobody wants to tell you that. Uh, so the top-down tools don't work and you've got to encourage the people you know, to use them as part of their job and then it allows you to basically do this multi-dimensional querying. Because I need to, you know, based on my discipline, if I'm in the head of molecular biology, you know, what's going on? Or, if we're about to make a decision, what do we know across all of the different disciplines that have contributed to that? Or if I'm managing a project, as head of a therapeutic area, I'm involved in pain. Uh, you know, in, not in creating pain, but pain therapeutics. Okay, I have several different projects on the way. Where are they at in the process? In a senior management, I've really got this portfolio. 
how many projects at different stages, etc. These are the things that I'd like to be able to do that in most organizations they can't do. So finally, this is, this is the typical situation we see with most IT projects. Initial excitement, use drops off. It is going to drop off. And the real question in most cases is, will it do this, continue to drop off and be ripped out, or will it actually come back? And what are the differences, you know, what, what drives ultimately acceptance and success in these organizations? And one, and I don't have time to go into the rest of them, one of the most important things is recognizing that there are different people. I showed you before involved in the clinical trial process what they're doing. The same is true, what's your level in the organization? And what, you know, what kind of information do you need? Lab workers in general say, I'm too busy. You know, I, who cares? My job is to put this data here. I don't care about the rest of the stuff. And you have to convince them that, if the, first of all, make it easy so they don't need convincing. And secondly, there's actually benefit from looking at that information. And then the project leaders usually love this stuff because they don't know what's going on. So they're the, the, the biggest boosters. And senior management print out their emails because they don't know how to, to read them otherwise. And I make that comment, and it's true in most organizations, senior management don't know how to use the email. Their secretaries print out the email, and they write a response, and then the secretary types it back again. In some of these huge technological, you know, sophisticated organizations. So these are, you know, these are some of the factors to think about getting uh, buy-in, etc. So my closing slide, if I could try and summarize everything. We've got these different stages of a process. We have to be thinking about how we're managing the data, creating knowledge, making decisions at different points, and then how are people interacting with the system throughout the entire process. So what now I have absolutely a blank. That's what we can talk about. <laughs>